being in the auditorium of the Henrico Theater and you see the lighting on the wall, the Art Deco details that surround you, those are things that kind of like put you in the mood. To have an auditorium full of individuals there to have the same interest in the program that you are paying for, for me, it gives me goosebumps. And that is why these theaters were built from the early 1900s. It brought people together under one roof to see a program and to share the experience. The Henrico Theater opened to the public on April 25th, 1938. The opening feature on that first day was uh, Thin Ice, starring Tyrone Power and Sonia Henney. She, of course, was an Olympic figure skater who went on to have a career in Hollywood. The cost of admission was 10 cents for children, 20 cents for adults, and then those were matinee prices. After five, it was 25 cents. Suburban growth in Henrico County was moving west for the most part. And this was a, a, a huge deal to have this out in Highland Springs. The newspaper even advertised that this was a, a project that was devoted to the people of Highland Springs and Sandston. And no expense was spared. It was a nearly $90,000 project. And in the 1930s, during the Depression, that was a lot of money. There was no other theater out that way. So that was new to that end of town. And of course the people in, even in Sandston were glad that it was close enough that they could come too. One of the things we do know about the Depression is that one of the things people didn't stop doing was go to the movies. So it made an affordable recreational activity for people. So to have something like this in your own neighborhood that you could walk to was just a really big deal. So the, the community took a lot of pride in it. It's located kind of in the heart of, of the historic Highland Springs. So. Um, you know, this would, be, would have been where all the people in the community would come to, um, you know, on a Friday night to go see the featured film. Hi. How many? Two. Plays weren't as prevalent back in that era, so instead of going out to a show, you went out to the movie. So they built these buildings more ornate than we build our movie theaters um, because it was an event to go to a movie. Charles Soma, the owner um, and builder of the Bird Theater in Carytown. He came to Highland Springs and, and built the Henrico Theater. Charles and Vian Soma were the investors builders of the Henrico Theater and it was actually B.N. Soma who actually ran the theater for a time. The younger brother of Mr. Soma thought he would like to have a theater and be manager of. So, um, Charles Sama had it built for his brother to manage. And um, so it was all over a sort of a, a family affair. He liked architecture and he traveled to get the architecture ideas. Edward Sennett Sr. of Richmond was the architect. He uh, established himself as an architect in 1925, had an apprentice with several very prestigious architectural firms. He didn't set up his own practice until 1934, and it was located on Cary Street in Richmond. There are papers of Sennett's at the Virginia Historical Society that indicate Senate signed on to be the architect of the theater in September of 1937, which is remarkable when you think about it, that would have been just seven months of construction to complete something uh, of this size and detail. His business really was concentrated on organizational, institutional um, work. He did other theaters. He did the Robinson Theater in Church Hill, which was also the Art Deco style. One of his most famous buildings is the Franklin Federal Savings and Loan, and that's downtown, and that is a, a wonderful example of Art Deco architecture. 
Art Deco is a um, style that really originated in the early 1900s and came to its height probably in the 30s. Um, and of course the theater was finished in 1938, very streamlined, geometric shapes, lots of times color. And you see it in the theater in several places. The, the canopy out front is one. Um, the vertical elements that are kind of striations on the front of the theater that are, that are uplit uh, and the stainless kind of eyebrow canopies. And then inside, especially in the two rooms upstairs, the um, lounges have stainless bands that run around the room that are give this kind of streamlined look. Very bold colors. Also some original lights in the theater itself um, are very art deco um, decorative pieces and then over the exits towards the front of the theater in the house itself um, are very uh, art deco decorative elements. Lots of the families in Holland Springs got to walk there and, and to the day they didn't have to drive cars or anything, they could walk there. We didn't have a whole lot of places out that way to, to go, you know, so we'd either have to catch the bus and go into town or we'd go down to Holland Spring. And this theater's big claim was it was the first one in the Richmond area to have air conditions, actually had two air handlers. Um, so that was its kind of big claim was you can come, you know, in the heat of Richmond to a indoor theater with air conditioning. It was touted in the Times-Dispatch. Uh, there was a full page ad talking about the opulence of this movie palace. They said the zest of springtime lingers throughout the year at the Henrico. Yes, the air conditioning was wonderful to be able to go in there and um, be nice and cool. The movies usually would run a week. And then if they were very popular, um, they would extend them into the second week. It wasn't a last pick of movies. It was, we, we stayed up with uh, a lot of the ones that were going on in Richmond and everything too. So it was, it was well run. The Henrico Theater was a sense of pride for everyone within the community. I mean, this was a big movie palace located in the suburbs, a rural suburb. It rivaled some of your theaters in town, but here it was, nine miles from Richmond, out in a rural part of Henrico County. So it was a real source of pride for everyone in the community. The Henrico Theater stayed open for about 24 years, closing its doors for the first time in 1962. The theater reopened in 1966, and over the next 10 years, there were four different owners until Charles Horn bought it in 1976. Hello, I'm Randy Horn. Uh, I uh, have uh, worked at this theater uh, since 1975. My father became the manager of this theater in 1975, and uh, I was 12 years old at the time, and I learned how to run these projectors here. The uh, prior owner uh, had to close the business in, in 76, and uh, my dad, he just immediately fell in love with the theater, with the, with the history of it, with the uh, town of Highland Springs, and, and just wanted to keep it uh, going. And, and at 13, uh, I went and uh, got a special work permit to where I could work here at the theater as well. I started off uh, doing everything from uh, tearing tickets to sweeping, sweeping popcorn to uh, selling tickets in the box office and concessions. The thing I enjoyed the most though was actually running the projectors. That was what I really enjoyed. The way the light would project onto the screen in the old days was through uh, what we call carbon arcs. And uh, these were kind of Kind of neat little things. These things are actually made out of uh, carbon uh, and copper. Copper coated carbon is what it is. And these would, would actually fuse together, form a light. This is what was called a reflector, would actually reflect the light, would shine through here. This would actually lift up, if you can see, and would shine through this part of the film and catch it and put the light on the screen. There was a sensor on the projector where if there was a film breakage, it was supposed to stop that projector. Sometimes that wouldn't work though, uh, and you would hear the audience scream and scream and yell, and uh, sometimes we'd open up the projection room door and you'd literally have film rolling, rolling out at your feet where it had kept, kept running and rolling. So we had some, some, uh, some scary moments. 
the theater business is ever changing and my dad always had had to come up with creative and innovative ideas to really keep uh, keep the interest uh, there like uh, for example when we played the movie E.T. We got one of the employees to dress up as E.T. and she'd go around with uh, bags of uh, Reese's Pieces and hand out to the kids. One of the things that he did was he, he got ticket prices down to a dollar, which uh, that was, when we first did that, that was one of the best times we ever had. If, in fact, some of the other theaters like the uh, Bird Theater and the Westover Theater, they went to 99 cents. Uh, after we went down to a dollar and we always used to ask my dad are we gonna go to 99 cents too and he said no nope, we're gonna just keep it a dollar we don't want to deal with that uh, change <laughs> it was a basically a no-brainer to me when my after my dad passed away in 92 even though I had a full-time business at the time I, I knew that uh, I just needed to keep the theater going it was so sentimental to myself and my family and and all the employees and uh, so I went ahead and, and uh, and kept the theater going, and um, as time went on, I came to uh, one of the toughest decisions I ever had to make in my life, and that was, uh, do I try to keep you know my full-time business going and keep the theater? And then when I discovered that the uh, county of Henrico was interested, uh, then then that that was just uh, perfect. In 1999, the county of Henrico stepped in and bought the theater and began the lengthy process of turning the building into what it is today. Knowing that the Henrico Theater was being purchased by the county, that took a big load off of one's chest or shoulders because I have seen over the years so many theaters that have been demolished, but that never happened with the Henrico Theater. When it was the county of Henrico's turn to step to the place, they did it in spades. Those first times into the building were definitely um, you felt like you were stepping back in time for sure. Dusty seats, um, you know, mold and mildew everywhere and peeling paint. In the lobby, it was funny, the popcorn maker was still here. Uh, there was popcorn still on the floor. It was pretty much like it had closed up on Friday night and, and left dormant. The first project that we worked on back in 1999 was to re-roof the building, dry the building in, and basically mothball it until a design and total project construction estimate could be determined on what funding would be needed to restore the facility. That first funding effort provided water, sewer, utilities, uh, site improvements. We knew that the future use of the building needed X amount of parking, it was going to be laid out a certain way, and, and those were things that were able to be done without really affecting you know, the, the really interior part of this building. The next year, in 2003, we did get some additional funding to build the additions onto the facility, and the building was extended lengthwise to provide additional space for theatrical rooms and provided enclosed mechanical electrical spaces. It wasn't until 2006 that we got the full funding to actually renovate the interior of the building. It's not all the time that you have an opportunity to deal with a building that's got such great existing decorative elements um, that you get to work with. So the challenge was to take those and to um, think of how you could bring those back to life and yet still make the theater something that was really functional for lots of different uses, and not just movies. Partway through the process, the building was actually put on a national register by the county, and so that caused us to have to rethink how we are approaching the interior, because the Park Service guidelines dictate that any new construction not look like the uh, original historical fabric, so that when someone walks into the building, they can tell what's new and what's existing. That was kind of a challenge because we were making major changes to the theater. We shortened the house from roughly 750 seats down to about 400 seats. Previously, when you entered the front door, there's a very tiny lobby and a, a stand where you bought popcorn. Then you pretty much went right into the theater. So we had to push all that back and create a lobby area, put bathrooms in. So the challenge was how do you keep tell what's original and how do you contrast with what's new. That's what you have to comply with if you are a national landmark is that you try to keep the pieces that are there. Um, you know, preserve if you can, restore if you have to. We found a historical paint analysis company in Baltimore 
that came down and over many, many years of being painted and repainted, it was more or less white. Everything was white. So their task was to scrape away layers of these paints and, and see what actually was there. And to our surprise, there were oranges and pinks and blues and lots of crazy silver and decorative elements that really reflected the Art Deco time period. The front canopy was kind of an issue. Um, there's a lot of deterioration and rust on the roof there, so we weren't able to retain that. We actually found a guy up in Richmond who builds race cars, and so he came on board and rebuilt that in his shop. That was kind of uh, like a compromise that, that we found. Um, not able to keep the exact pieces, but trying to restore it to to the way it was. You've got to really develop a relationship with the, um, the contractor and the foreman on site to say, look, if you're going to tear this off and not use it, please contact us, we'll come get it. And the contractor that was used for the theater was very, very agreeable to that. Here in the theater, the chairs are all new and the top pieces are new. The end standards are all original. Each of the end caps, which is the last seat on each row, um, the side portion that is often lit on the side, those were removed and conserved and then put back on the new seats. Another really wonderful detail is the decorative band that runs across the ceiling of the theater. And there's actually a stained glass medallion that at the time the theater was built, it really would have been smack dab in the middle of the movie house. And it's a horizontal um, stained glass, which is very unusual. Stained glass is typically vertical. Interesting thing about stained glass is over time, if you keep it um, suspended, the weight of the glass actually made, um, made it drop a little bit. So what they did when they took it out to restore it is we actually had to flip that stained glass. Instead of being concave, it's, we flipped it so that the, the bulge is now up and then over time, it's going to drop back into place. The carpet was, um, it's not original, but they basically, they, they took pictures um, of what the original carpet looked like and then tried to find the best pattern to match the original. We were left with a scrap about, you know, 12 by eight um, of the original carpet. And that was our sample that we had to go by along with black and white photos that we had. We actually in-house designed the the carpet pattern based off of that original carpet. Um, so we drew and did a color rendering of what we wanted this carpet to look like. And so it's it's custom carpet based on on our take on the original carpet. This is the men's smoking lounge. This would have been used as a smoking lounge and as a restroom. The restroom facilities were located right off of the lounge. A lot of the elements in this room are original. The uh, chrome molding is original. The paint scheme's original. A lot of care was taken into um, researching the paint, making sure that um, we maintain the plaster. These are plaster walls. The moldings on all the doors are the original molding. A lot of the pictures in, in the room were the same actors and actresses that would have been displayed at the, the time period that the building opened. This lounge actually would have been a women's smoking lounge, um, but when we opened, we decided to move this over to be the men's lounge to correspond with the restrooms downstairs. We donated the, uh, the one projector in its original state. We, we donated that to the county in, in basically in memory of my dad and, uh, and, and some of the old things that have some historic value to them. They were part of the theater when we got here and I thought they should remain uh, with the theater. This projector is kind of the, the main focal point when people come in. It's kind of the centerpiece out here in the lobby. What else do you remember? Everything. Funny, I could talk all day. <laughs> so the, the stage is kind of what makes this building unique, that we can now do live performance as well as movies. Then a farmer drove her to another house by the north. From there, she went on foot to, to freedom. freedom. We fit the building with new equipment. We have over 100 dimmers for lighting for live shows. Um, we had drapes brought in, curtains. The screen now is a roll-up screen, but it's still the same, um, same type of material. It's perforated so that you can put the movie speakers behind it, and then the screen allows the sound to pass through the screen.
typically um, houses would have had a fixed screen in place, um, but it still would have been a perforated screen with the, with the main speakers being put behind the screen. Um, and that gives you the effect of the audio is supposed to sound like it's coming from the actors or actresses. We have all the equipment that you would need to do um, a performance, um, not just a film. And a lot of people expect to see just an old movie house um, when we can do a variety of things. Nobody thinks about Grover Cleveland. James K. Polk doesn't get any credit at all. This is a, a new addition. It's a hallway that leads from the front lobby area to our backstage area. It was put in so that when you have live performances, people related to the show can get from the dressing room backstage area up to the lobby without having to go through the theater itself to interrupt what was going on in there. This is the original exterior wall. Um, they were able to salvage most of the brick here. Um, other than the new openings, you'll actually be able to see on the wall some original nails from parking lot signs and things of that nature. This is one of our 35 millimeter projectors. We actually have two. We run 20 minute film at a time and we change over. There's three different lenses that we have depending on what era the movie was made. This is a newer version that's on there and then this is the newest version which is a cinema scope which kind of gives you that widescreen look that you see at the theaters today. When film gets shipped here, it gets shipped on plastic reels and then we have to transfer them over to our newer reels and we put our film on these reels and then run the film off of these reels on our projector. And we have a digital projector now so we can show films um, on DVD or Blu-ray um, from this device and it is all controlled from our processor which is located in this rack. We also run our lights from up here so this is our lighting console when we do live performances and we can run a number of different channels and different dimmers from this console. It's one of the joys of being an architect is you get to see a finished product and you get to see people being able to appreciate um, something that they might have walked by and not noticed before. Take a walk by there and stop for a moment. Look up at the theater. Look at the neon spelling out Henrico at the top of the theater. Look at the Art Deco detail in the facade. Then you have a totally repaired or new marquee with lots of neon, the small bulbs under the marquee, just like it was back in 1938 when it opened. That Art Deco design that's highlighted at night, it will take your breath away. As an architect, it's almost weird, like having a child, you know, I, I'm proud of that building. I mean, and I'm like, I'm proud of my son, you know, it's, it's part of you after you've worked on it for so many years. Without the county acting, it was, it was gonna fall into disrepair and be a historic resource that was lost forever. It's one of the dominant features in the Nine Mile Road corridor and it should act as a catalyst to help you know, bring back and restore uh, this part of the county. We had a great experience at the opening of the theater. The former staff of the theater, we had gotten all the addresses from the former owner and we invited them and so they were very excited to be here. The employees, we just, uh, we really uh, turned into, uh, you know, it was kind of like working with family. I'm very passionate about the theater, I always uh, have been and uh, every time I'm out this way, I'll usually will we'll swing by and just uh, take a look. These theaters will never ever be built again and we need to appreciate them for what they are. They need to be loved, they need to be appreciated, they need to be preserved. Because never again will we see these theaters constructed again. Mm -hmm.